Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. Our guest this week, Delith Jewell, has been a member of the Senate since February 2019 and has had a stratospheric rise since her election, becoming one of the most dynamic members of the Fifth Senate. She now holds the role of Shadow Minister for Transforming Public Services in the future and will be the lead candidate for Plaid Cymru in South Wales East and Caerphilly in this year's Senate election, whenever they eventually happen. Hi, Delith. How are you? Hi. Oh, gosh, thank you so much for those lovely words. <laughs> That's very kind of you. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you very much for coming on. Um, if it's all right with you, we'll start uh, at the very beginning. You come from quite a traditionally Labour area. What made you join Plaid Cymru? So I'm from the Rumney Valley and my father, um, you're definitely right that the area traditionally um, was obviously far more of a stronghold for Labour. My father is actually, we have to go back to his childhood um, but he was brought up by uh, my grandparents who were very strong Labour supporters at the time. He, they would go, I think, every Saturday on the bus from Nelson to Pontypridd. And on the way uh, to Pontypridd, I think it's at the Fiddler's Elbow roundabout, there was uh, a pub uh, and someone had written, uh, it was Harry Webb actually and John Davis, the historian, had written on, big uh, on the wall in big letters in paint, Free Wales. And apparently every now and again, someone would get up on a ladder and scribble out the W. And so it just said free ales and they'd put an arrow going to the pub and then someone would put the W back. And so it, it, it was a bit like the Kovich Duera mural. And he asked my grandfather uh, on the bus, you know, why is it that someone has written free Wales up there? And my grandfather had said, oh, well, Auntie, you know, actually there's some people who think that Wales should be uh, an, an independent nation and my father at the, <laughs> at the time I just thought well yes of course so he uh, was a really uh, strong supporter of Plaid the idea of independence and I suppose and I, I think that the the most you know most people when when you talk about oh when did you first become kind of very politically aware in a real sense most people probably wouldn't have one moment but I genuinely do have one moment which is um, my father and I had gone to Gwynvor Evans's funeral, uh, and it was a few weeks, I think a few weeks, before I went away to university. It was in 2005, and I was very aware that I was going away to England to university, and I, uh, after the funeral, it was in Aberystwyth, and in truly Welsh fashion, everyone kind of poured out onto the street afterwards to sing my hymn, Lad Van Hardai, and I got, just got this moment of, like, oh, he'd say in Welsh, yes, like, like, um, like a shiver uh, going through it, but like a, a positive shiver, <laughs> shiver then. And I just thought I might be going away to England, but I'm never going to want this to leave me. And I suppose I, from then on, I just really knew that I still, I really wanted to come back to Wales and that this was always going to be something really important to me. So they call that here, I, we will obviously do that because it's the name of the party. So we'll, we'll just <laughs> go for that. Um, you worked <laughs> You worked in the UK Parliament for Plaid for a while. Is that what initially inspired you to be a politician yourself or is there something else that made you want to take public office? Yeah, that was my first job when I left university. I was I was a researcher uh, in the Commons. I, I definitely wanted to go to do something with my life that was going to help people. I hadn't thought at the time that uh, like, oh, I definitely want to become a politician myself, that that wasn't really on my radar at all at the time, certainly at the beginning. Uh, I had so much uh, respect for the MPs and for David Wigley and the laws when I when I was working there. Um, but I, I thought, oh, well, you know, that there would be other ways that I could help improve people's lives. I mean, <laughs> a lot of the a number of the uh, politicians I was talking to at the time, they I was working for at the time, they had kind of encouraged me to think about this. Um, but it it, 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 it didn't actually, it wasn't something that I thought, right, I will do this job in order to go on and do this. But I mean, the, the job I had after that was working for Citizens Advice in Cardiff. And I, you know, well, to be political for a moment, I suppose all oh, this is going to be political, isn't it? But I, I saw firsthand the impact of the really cruel austerity policies that the Tories were uh, pursuing. And I also saw how vital it is to be able to to not take people's agency away to be able to not just help people but that every single life is precious that anyone who is going through uh, a really unfortunate thing in their life that could happen to any of us that there's so much there's so little empathy 
in politics and, and, and that was something that made me really angry and that made me I guess more determined that I wanted to do something that actually could help change it not just bemoan the fact that it was happening and not just helping people on an individual level which is so vitally important but trying to also change things nationally. So you, you when you came into the Senate it was sadly under very tragic mm-hmm. circumstances obviously with the sad passing of, of Stephen Lewis just how difficult was that period for you and did you have any sort of mixed emotions about becoming an MS? Definitely, definitely. Um, Over all that period of time since I was working in Westminster it's been something that I guess was percolating and that I want and from 26, well 2015 I really really wanted to to, to take on this role and then when I, uh, when we didn't get the second seat in South Wales East I had assumed that that was then that was certainly close certainly for a number of years and I was then doing another role in, in another charity and it, it, it's it's something that in terms of mixed emotions I mean it was certainly uh, the word bittersweet I think is used an awful lot and I'm not sure that they it, it, it has lots of odd connotations but this feeling of tremendous guilt to be honest and I know that it was in no way my fault and no one you know it, it, you know Stefan passing away couldn't have been seen as anything that was my fault but I still felt guilt I still um felt that it was so desperately unfair what had happened and I said when I first came to the Senate that I wanted to share the role with Stefan and I will, I think for, for however long I'm lucky enough to be a member of the Senate, I will always feel that I am sharing it with him. And I actually, I don't see that as in any way a negative thing. I see it as quite the reverse. I really feel honoured that I will always in some ways be seen as sharing this with him. I, I, I really hope that people will always think of that because I, I want him to always be part of, of what I'm doing. You're now in the Plaid Shadow Cabinet in your role uh, for transforming public services in the future. Would you be able to talk a little bit more about that role and what it sort of means? It's not one that's in any of the other parties' uh, cabinets or shadow cabinets. How do you envisage it working? And if it were to be in government, what sort of thing would it become? Yeah, that's a good question. It's an existentially interesting situation to be shadowing a role that doesn't exist. (laughs) Because if you're shadowing someone, a, a, a role that is a ministerial portfolio, then obviously they are specific question slots in the Senate where you can hold someone to account. Transforming public service is that half of it. Um, I see it very much as something which is, uh, has come to the fore a lot more with the COVID pandemic. The need for public services to, to interact, to work closely together, for services to be designed around the reality of people's lives now, rather than the ideal of how we hope people will live their lives which is never you know there is no such thing as as the perfect human being who who behaves in the rational way all the time none of us do Uh, and that's something that certainly came out a lot when I was working in citizens advice that you see that there's so many services that are predicated on the assumption that once someone I don't know needs a certain amount of help that they will know exactly where to go to turn for help and that they will do that themselves even though they're in a really difficult position because maybe they've lost their job or something. I think that again because of the pandemic we've seen local authorities and health boards and yes central governments on a number of different levels working together really importantly. Um, I think we need to see far more of that. Uh, I think that we need to make sure that that is one of the lessons of COVID that we don't lose uh, after the pandemic. And in terms of the second part of the role, uh, yeah, Shadow Minister for the Future, it's <laughs> Adam Price, the party leader, had pointed out that this was an idea that actually Kurt Vonnegut had put forward, that the role of Minister for the Future was something that was missing from every government in the world, but that was probably the most necessary, which would be a role tasked with ensuring that decisions made today will not impact badly on future generations. Now, obviously, in in Wales, we actually have been pioneering for many years because of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, the creation of a Future Generations Commissioner. So this role would be ensuring that there was someone in the cabinet 
who is coordinating all of that work and making sure that things like making sure that we have uh, when budget decisions are made that actually we are think quantifying how it's going to impact on future generations that um we're not i don't know going uh, going down the pfi route uh, of just burdening future generations with with different debts and things like that so it, it, it's very wide reaching but i think that actually it's that wales should be the first nation in the world to introduce this role because of all of the what's the word the the, the the foundational work that actually should really be applauded that, that that's been put in place. I mean, it, it, it's not without its issues, but gosh, it's exciting that that legislation exists. Can you tell us any sort of practical policies you think will be in the Plaid Manifesto whenever the election happens that are related to transforming public services? Can you think of anything in particular that people will react positively to? You think? But I think the the main one that I think people will certainly after the last year will react positively to uh, it, it's something which is going to be I think in uh, not only the applied manifesto but it, it was at first and foremost applied policy was the integration of health and social care uh, and and I think that anyone who was uh, in any way unsure or uncertain about this idea before the pandemic surely uh, anyone who is progressive would have been convinced of the need to integrate these two services after everything that we've seen i mean looking at what's happened with people in care homes uh, the, the different plight that people are facing th that should all be one service health care workers and social care workers should have parity not just of esteem but of pay uh, and I believe that that should be paid for through general taxation, although that is a live debate. <laughs> How have you found uh, shadowing the Welsh Government during the coronavirus pandemic? Uh, how have you been able to balance that need for scrutiny whilst also not trying to make it uh, overly political? That's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, I won't say that, that that isn't something which is sometimes <laughs> at the forefront of my mind, because it is actually. I am acutely aware, and I think most people would be, of the fact that government ministers, government officials, anyone working in public life at the moment is under extreme pressure, as everyone is. We are all operating under really bizarre and unusual and unnatural circumstances and pressures. I think that because of the pandemic, it is even more important to hold the government to account. But there are added, there are added dimensions to it, aren't there? Uh, I know that at some point, it was early in the pandemic, uh, I think it was maybe, maybe April last year, I had been really angry and upset isn't quite the right word, but I, I, I was certainly angry and frustrated and a little bit horrified by some of what was happening in care homes. And I had uh, raised this uh, it, with uh, with Vaughan Gething in, in, in questions and he'd responded you know and I, I, I suppose the, the language I was using was, was very emotionally driven um, and he'd um, responded in quite an emotionally driven way as well and these things you know and, and I and I am not someone who in my personal life I don't like confrontation but I suppose in my working life in in the political sphere i i try to think of, of advice that someone else had given me which is to remember that when you are holding someone to account you're not doing it for you you're doing it for the people that you represent and sometimes yet yeah, sometimes that is a challenge but it's a challenge that i have to force myself to do uh, even when it, it it feels unpleasant but i think that you know it's, we're all operating in the confines of we do need to be aware of the added pressures uh, that everyone's operating under. And you know what? We are also all human. Um, and I think it's something that people do forget, you know, and, and we can all be guilty of that. But um, yeah, I, I guess, I'm, Matt, I'm, I'm answering you in, in a really divided way because I guess I do feel <laughs> conflicted about it because I, I think on the one hand, it's my my instinctive reaction <laughs> with a lot of this is uh, to be aware of that stuff and then also this this driving awareness in me which is that it is actually even more important to ask the really uncomfortable difficult questions as uncomfortable as that can seem sometimes we'll come back to uh the coronavirus pandemic in a little bit 
but let's go on to the topic of, of government. Looking at the polls, and I'm being a bit of a hostage to fortune now because there's a barometer poll coming out a few hours after we record this. But from the ones we've seen, it's going to be really difficult to apply to form a government. How do you see that happening? Do you see that being a one to one election uh, move, or do you think it may take a couple of elections for Plaid to get to that position to be able to form a majority government? Fair question. I mean, in terms of with Plaid, we are obviously working within very odd circumstances for two reasons. One, obviously the pandemic. Also because of the, I guess these aren't odd circumstances, but they're peculiar circumstances, which is the electoral system that we have. Um, and so they are confines on what is going to be possible with that. I would say this, wouldn't I? But it is so vitally important, I think, for there to be at least some change in government in Wales. I think, I suspect, that lots of members of the Labour Party would feel this as well in a really perverse way. Uh, it's in no way the Labour Party's, no, I, I, what I mean by this is, it's not healthy for the Labour Party that the Labour Party's been in government the whole time since we've had devolution. I cannot possibly blame Labour for being in government, of course they'd want to be. It's partly the fault of the electoral system, partly the fault of other political parties for not managing to do it. But it's a weird situation where because Labour's been in government the whole time, you've got this odd conflation of the Senate as an institution and the Welsh Government, and people assume that it's the same thing. Uh, and that becomes very negative. For, so when people criticise the Welsh Government, they criticise the concept of devolution. And I think, and again, that's not, the concept in itself isn't the Labour Party's fault. For lots of different reasons, I really do think that we do need to have some change. I, for the fact that independence is becoming so much more of a realistic and necessary eventuality, um, I, I think that has to be driven forward. It, it, I, I'm, I, I'm very aware, Matt, that I'm not actually directly answering your question. If we do not see a significant and positive and progressive change in the government of Wales after May, then I'm actually quite frightened of what could happen because either that happens or I'm worried that there's going to be some kind of slide back. We, basically, the status quo just doesn't seem like it's an option anymore. We've got, it, it's becoming more and more apparent with the Conservative Party uh, that they are going to be presumably in favour of, at the very least, dismantling parts of devolution. Um, so I think there is an obligation on progressive parties to find a way of advancing this. And hey, for independence, I think that we do need to have Plaid in government in order to ensure that we actually can deliver uh, that. But again, these are all very live issues. Is that a fair yeah. way of answering that? Oh, well, we'll see what the next question brings. So you talk about independence. Um, I mean, you've seen lots of polls recently where you've got uh, a majority of Labour supporters backing independence, large amounts of Liberals and Greens. And there's been a significant increase in support for independence across the board, but there's not been a similar shift in support towards Plaid. Why do you think this is? And, you know, apart from saying, well, if you want independence, you've got to vote for it. How do Plaid actually change this? It's a very fair and difficult challenge, um, because obviously I, I, I would delight in seeing a surge in support for Plaid and, and yeah Matt you've uh, you've anticipated one of the points that I would make there which is that I would hugely encourage uh, people who support independence to vote for Plaid in May if nothing else but in, in order to ensure that the debate that is going on in the Labour Party at the moment actually does push the Labour Party towards actually seeing that this is something that that has to be uh, no not that, that has to be embraced that's that's the wrong way of looking at it that it is the only option that, that doesn't involve us sliding back then. I think that yes, Cymru is excellent and again, a, a necessary force in that it is an apolitical entity. Uh, I think that the idea of yes, Cymru appeals to people in a way that transcends the support of any political party. So I think that the fact that we've seen a surge in support for uh, uh, Yes Cymru and independence has equally happened at a time when people have gained a lot of uh, awareness of devolution. 
um, appreciation of the fact that when the Welsh Government has decided to go it alone on things, that that, for the most part, has actually been a really positive thing. Uh, so I think it might be partly because we're living in a really bizarre time and the frustration with Westminster has led to two simultaneous things happening, which is people's appreciation of devolution, which for the reasons we've just been discussing, ends up being conflated with the Welsh Government as well because of uh, lots of different factors, including the media. And so people uh, are, are favouring the idea of independence, but, but maybe there, there'll be lots of people who this is their political renaissance, you know, that this is, the, this is their awakening. Um, I just hope that as debates continue, as we get uh, closer towards the election, that um, more people are able to be uh, able to see that actually Adam Price uh, is the only leader who actually, uh, well, the only leader of, of a major party, I, I people won't like to say that, but the only party of one of the parties that are currently favoured by the electoral system that we have in Wales, <laughs> who uh, could possibly be a first minister who would deliver an independence referendum. Do you think there's any danger that speaking too much on a constitutional matter like independence in an election that will inevitably be consumed by a health and economic crisis is a danger for Plaid? Or do you think it will be an advantage? I know that there are different there are different ways of looking at the concept of independence. I fully respect the fact that for many people, they will see it primarily as a constitutional question and as as I would characterize it as reaching the mountain top, and that's it. And, and you know, that's what we're aiming for. Fully respect that, but just for me, it's the opposite. Uh, for me, I see independence as base camp, uh, or even before you get to base camp, I see it as starting on the journey. It allows you to have the tools on your back that you can actually make that climb. And I, rather than some people want independence and then we'll have the debate afterwards about what kind of independent nation we want to be. Now, for me, it is fundamental. We want, I want independence in order to have the tools to improve the lives of the people of Wales. And um, because that, yes, as a principle, it's, it's fundamentally important to me that people should have their own voices amplified. Uh, but it, for me, it isn't just a remote constitutional question. It's about the bread and butter issues. It's about improving those things. It's a, and so framing that, I think, is what's crucial. Um, and I think it would be a huge, huge and easy to make a mistake in some ways for us to focus too much on the constitutional element of it. Uh, you know, the, and don't get me wrong. I know that there are lots of really important debates that are happening at the moment. You know, the Labour Party is having a debate about uh, moving towards federal model I, I think the time for that has passed but I think it's important that, that, that it, it's encouraging that that is happening we've got Tories who are now going to no longer be in the Senate sadly like David Melding who are, are grappling with these issues in a really thoughtful way too I think that events have almost overtaken um, the debate I think that the danger of course is that people would see independence as a constitutional remote issue but that's only a danger if it's framed in that way. I think that it's incumbent on us to, to show that actually independence is vital in order to do all these things. Do you think Wales has the media necessary to, to allow you to, uh, to, to differentiate those things, though, to be able to say to people, it's not just about a constitutional issue, it's about every step after that. Do you think there is the power in the media in Wales, or do you think that may be... Uh, a problem between now and whenever the election is? I think that the the media deficit uh, is a problem that hinders almost everything to do with politics in Wales. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't say that it's not an issue. They, it will be a challenge for all political parties to find new ways of engaging with voters ahead of the election, again, where, whenever it might be, um, presuming that it is, or assuming rather it's going to be in May. It, uh, uh, of course, that's an issue. And so I think that it's really important that we don't get lost in echo chambers. Don't get uh, don't assume that uh, because we're winning arguments on Twitter, that means that we're arguing that we're winning the arguments um, out on the streets because Twitter is not the same thing at all. And I think that, that that's that's a danger we all need to be alive to. But I, I think that the fact that we've had this surge in support in a number of different uh, polls uh, that, that is something that comes on the back of 
the phenomenon that we saw, no, not last year, the year before with all the marches, they were a really positive thing. And I mean that in its true sense. I can't think of many other, if any, marches in recent political history that were marching about something or in favor of something. It's almost always that people go out, feel motivated to go out to protest against something. And that wasn't the character of those marches. And so we need to find ways in a pandemic situation with lockdowns, which is really difficult. And yes, with the media deficit in order to have these conversations, I wish we could have town hall meetings because I think this is something that has to be debated and talked about with every community in Wales. Because you know, if you are, a, if you are talking about having a fundamental shift like independence, that can't be something which is decided on height. That has to be something that is decided by the people of Wales. And I, I think, I believe strongly that if we have, the, if we find a way of having those conversations, which of course is difficult um, in the current circumstances, but when we are in that kind of position, I really believe that the majority of the people of Wales would actually agree because they would be able to form these ideas, not, not just be told what it would mean. Talking about having those conversations, are you concerned at all about not being able to door knock and speak to people on the streets before the, the elections? And, and do you think that there's a, ha there's a danger that people do just fall into their echo chambers? Absolutely, that, that uh, I have really missed uh, the, the opportunity to be able to get out and do that because that actually is one of the parts of my job that I do really enjoy the most. I really like talking to people. I really like um, having even sometimes not the really horrible conversations, but the challenging conversations. Um, because actually then you can understand why, why you maybe have a disconnect with people and you can hear a little bit more about the other side. I think that's something which has impoverished us all in politics this year. It was inevitable. I think it is only right. We have to put public safety first. Um, but of course, it's been a loss. And uh, again, depending on when the election happens, um, it, it will inevitably, it will mean that this election is of a very different character. And yes, there are innovative things that we can all do, but it, it, there is no replacement for being able to actually meet someone face to face. We've got back to the media. We've, lots of people call for the devolution of, uh, of broadcasting. Obviously, if you if Wales were independent, it would be within the Senate's purview. What do you beyond that though? What do you think is necessary to change the democratic and media deficit that Wales has? Is it just as simple as having a having our own BBC or having our own broadsheet newspaper, or do you think it goes deeper than that? I think it does go deeper but again I think it's one of those things that is uh, a, a cyclical thing again I think it, it has to start with education um, and I think it's really positive that 60 and 17 year olds are going to be able to vote this time and I, I, we, we can hope that there will be changes to the curriculum uh, in terms of political awareness because if people vote when they are young, then they're far more likely to go on to continue voting. So I think that that's going to be a really positive change, which will now happen over time. We can't take it for granted. But what by, I suppose that having a distinct, a, a, a completely distinct media landscape uh, in Wales, I don't think the importance of that can be overestimated because it's about the importance of stories. It's about the importance of reading stories that reflect your life and your neighbours' lives and that reflect on those things. And uh, it, no disrespect whatsoever meant to, well, it's not English-based media, it's London-based media, because I think that many regions of England um, miss out, not to the same extent, but certainly to, to an extent with this as well. When the stories are edited or are written from a perspective through another lens, then you never get a true reflection. And you get things like the re well, one of the good things that's happened with the pandemic, there are few, but there's <laughs> some, um, is that the London-based media have been forced to acknowledge devolution. That they were forced quite early on in the pandemic, to be fair to them, by partly by the Welsh government themselves, to make clear if a health decision is just England only. Uh, Boris Johnson has become the Prime Minister of England only for a lot of the pandemic. I still don't think it's gone strong uh, far enough, but 
it's it's such a shame that it took a pandemic for that to happen. You keep guessing my question, so I'm going to change it up and ask you a slightly different one. I Do haven't you... seen your, your sheet, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that that will continue? Do you think that um, London-based media interest in Wales will continue after the pandemic? Or do you think it's just a, a subject-specific coverage? Who can know? But if I had to guess, I would say that no, it would not continue. Because even with the coverage we get at the moment, it's very skewed. Uh, there tends to only be nationwide coverage of Welsh events when the Welsh government has been criticised. Uh, so, you know, with the fire break uh, that, that, that came in at the end of last year, the non-essential items debacle, um, Welsh government, the Welsh government were heavily criticised for that, even though the uh, UK government for England did largely the same thing a few weeks later, but you never saw any editorial saying, oh, actually, Wales were ahead of the game with it. So I think that it is skewed, and, and we tend, the coverage we get of Welsh events will either be when there's been some almighty, I think the technical term is cock up, or when there's some kind of silly story. Like, do you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, the goats in Llandidno had come down from the Great Orm, and so they were kind of roaming the streets and there were lots of photographs. And it was very kind of, it was a lovely touching thing, but then that made kind of, for everyone listening, I'm doing bunny ears, um, national news, so to speak, but that, that meant made the UK news. And why does it have to be that there's either something where they can laugh at us or they're saying, look how terrible it is things are in Wales. You know, think it, it, it isn't a neutral system. If it were, then, then we wouldn't be having the same conversation. But uh, I'm afraid that even in the midst of a pandemic, uh, the coverage still isn't neutral. Do you think the Welsh Government have communicated well enough to, to counteract all that weak or negative coverage? And on the whole, not good, not well enough, no. I, um, I really was very, uh, I was applauding the fact that the Welsh Government official Twitter account on a number of occasions have actually quote tweeted um, broadcasters uh, saying, uh, you mean England only or not in Wales. So I, I've, you know, don't get me wrong, there have been some really positive uh, stances that have been taken with that. But failures in communication um, from the Welsh Government have been, I think, at the heart of most, not all, but most of the uh, issues that we've had. It, it's either when information or guidelines haven't been given in good time or uh, the information just hasn't been disseminated quickly enough or like, again, the day that we're recording this, the um, the First Minister had been on the Today programme and was questioned about why uh, there was a delay with uh, the Pfizer vaccine rollout in Wales. And the answer that he gave then was seemingly contradicted twice then by um, spokespeople for the Welsh Government during the day today. It's just, I get frustrated with that, I suppose, because unfortunately, because of all the things that we're talking about, when the Welsh Government does mess something up, they get very unfairly criticised compared with, you know, the fact that they don't ever get the praise when they do get things right from the UK media. And unfortunately, because of all the issues that we've also been talking about, when uh, the Welsh government is criticised, it ends up being the concept of devolution, which is blamed. Do you think there's a danger that the increased coverage of devolution without an in-depth analysis could actually lead to a rise in support for abolition of the Senate. Yeah, I think that if um, if narratives like this are framed in an irresponsible way, then I think that there is definitely a danger of that. And I think that sometimes I'm afraid that the BBC can frame it in, in an irresponsible way. I'm picking on the BBC because uh, I think the BBC is a phenomenally important institution. But, but because of the, uh, we saw this with Brexit too, because the of the impartiality uh, necessity, it is misunderstood by so many people to mean you have to give equal prominence to the two sides, even if the one side is, sorry, just not reputable <laughs> in, in, in the claims that they're making. So I think that, yeah, there is an onus on everyone in public life, including broadcasters uh, and commentators, to be responsible in the way uh, that facts are reported about this and in the way that, that, that this, these debates are framed. And yeah, that's on all of us, I think. Do you think people who are now calling for abolition are doing so because they genuinely believe that the institution is not worthwhile? Or do you think it's because 
for a lot of them, their party can't win an election there. And that's why they're annoyed. So in terms of the people who are like prominent in the debate, because I, I think there's a there's a real difference. A lot of people who softly support the idea, I think it will be, be because of uh, them conflating the idea of the Senate and, and the Welsh government that we've already been talking about. Um, I think in terms of the people who are you know, political parties who are pushing for it, yeah, frankly, I, I, I think that that is a large part of it. We've seen how some members of the Senate who won't be named, but will be obvious from the context of what I'm saying, you know, that they, they've changed their stance quite blatantly and obviously because they're just, you know, any port in a storm. They're just looking for a, a desperate way to remain relevant. And also the fact that that seems to, yeah, it's not just that this it, it is the new Brexit, <laughs> but also the fact that, yeah, I think that, there are lots of problems with the electoral system that we've got in the Senate. Um, I would favour moving to a fully PR system, um, but uh, with the current system, yeah, that, that um, one party in particular is certainly favoured. Um, and I suppose that one of the other main opposition parties, the Conservatives, have made a really cynical uh, calculation um, uh, and presumably uh, can see that a lot of their support um, would increase if they cash in on that more uh, cynical uh, viewpoint. I mean, I, I'm saying that's why it's happened, but I think it's pretty reprehensible that they're doing it, to be honest. Are you at all concerned about some of the groups that are funding these parties? And do you think that the groups that used to have Brexit as their main target are now turning their attention to Wales and how much does that worry you? The more you look into how some of these either uh, nominal institutions or pressure groups are being funded, I mean it, it's a very dark web and it's all, it all seems to be connected in a slightly insidious way. I think that there's a real danger with that because if you don't know who is funding uh, someone, then you can't know for whom they're speaking, because they're not speaking for themselves, and they're certainly not speaking for the people that they're representing. There, there, there's another agenda there, and uh, yeah, that, that, that is certainly something that concerns me, definitely. It undermines the concept of democracy, doesn't it? Well, Dara, thank you so much for being on the show with us this evening. It's been great having you here. If people want to find you on Twitter, where should they go? So my Twitter, well, my, my work Twitter is Delft Jewel AM. I tried to change it to AM. <laughs> if you look at my personal one, you'll get a lot of poetry and stuff. So if you want to know politics, it'll be Delft Jewel AM. <laughs> well, thank you very much, um, both for the poetry and the politics. But it's been lovely to have oh, you yeah, here. Oh, yeah, there's a mix of the two. There's politics on the personal one, too. It's just if you don't like Yates, then, you know, <laughs> you'll get quite a lot of retweets of that, too. Uh, well, thanks so much for coming on uh, and for everyone who's listened to us today. Uh, if you like what you've heard, please don't forget to find us on Medium at Here Right Blog Cymru, on Facebook at Here Right Blog Cymru and on Twitter at Here Right Blog. Thank you for listening to Here Right. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review.